this has been a productive couple of days with very, very intensive talks. Uh, and though we're not uh, done yet, obviously, I want to catch you up on the most recent negotiations to give you a sense of where we are. But before we do, um, I really want to say a word, brief word about uh, the situation in South Sudan. Uh, for the last several weeks, uh, all of us at the uh, upper levels of the Obama administration have been working together and constantly uh, talking to the leaders uh, in South Sudan, working with our special envoy, Ambassador Don Booth, working with our ambassador, Susan Page, uh, and working with all of our, uh, our uh, colleague countries. Uh, who are engaged in trying to prevent the violence of South Sudan. Uh, and the United States remains deeply committed uh, to supporting the efforts that will bring this violence to an end. Uh, we've been involved in this for a long time. We're involved in the birth of this nation. Uh, and I personally know the leaders. I've been there many, many number, a number of times. Um, and, and so I think all of us feel a very personal stake in trying to uh, avert uh, tribal warfare and ethnic confrontation on the ground, as well as uh, any kind of uh, resolution of political differences by force. Uh, the beginning of direct talks between the parties, as announced by the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, is a very important step. Uh, but make no mistake, it is only a first step. Uh, and there's a lot more to do. Uh, both parties need to put the interests of South Sudan above their own. And that has been a message we have consistently delivered to those engaged in this conflict. Uh, the negotiations have to be serious. They cannot be a delay gimmick uh, in order to continue the fighting and try to find advantage on the ground at the expense of the people of South Sudan. Uh, they have to be credible talks, and both parties need to approach the talks with courage, with resolve, with the clear intent of trying to find a political solution. So we call on the parties to listen uh, to the region and to the international community in finding a peaceful way forward uh, to resolve this conflict. As we've said before, the United States will support uh, those who seek peace, but we will deny support, and we will work to apply international pressure to any elements that attempt to use force to seize power. That is not acceptable. The talks in Addis Ababa, we believe, are absolutely the best way forward, and the world is going to be watching very closely to see uh, that a halt to the fighting on the ground takes place. Uh, and to test the good faith of leaders uh, of any group, uh, and particularly the two most uh, critical uh, players here, President Keir and uh, former Vice President Rek Machar, both of them uh, need to push their people to come to the table here. The fighting must end, and we seek tangible process towards peace on the ground. Uh, Obviously, it is this effort to try to make peace that has brought me back here again uh, to Israel, to Jerusalem. And I want to thank Prime Minister Netanyahu and I want to thank President Abbas for the significant amount of time and for the effort and energy that they've expended in order to engage in very serious conversations uh, about the way forward. Uh, over the past few days, I've had two lengthy rounds with each leader and with their teams. And we have uh, had very positive, but I, but I have to say very uh, serious, very intensive conversations. <clears throat> These issues are not easy. As I've said before, if this was easy, uh, this would have been resolved a long time ago. It is not easy. These are complicated issues that involve the survival and the future of peoples. And this is a conflict that has gone on for too long, so positions are hardened. Mistrust, obviously, 
exists at a very high level. Uh, and so you have to work through that and around that and over that. Uh, and every step is a step that uh, is to try to point the path forward and the ways in which each side uh, can uh, build uh, a relationship and trust over a period of time. <clears throat> uh, today, I am leaving Jerusalem in order to go to Jordan and consult with His Majesty King Abdullah uh, and his team. <clears throat> and from there, I will leave to go to Saudi Arabia to consult with His Majesty King Abdullah uh, of the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, who is, of course, the author of the Arab Peace Initiative and <clears throat> has a very significant interest and stake uh, in this process. Uh, <clears throat> I will then return here uh, to Jerusalem tonight. Uh, we will continue discussions at staff level, a period of time. And uh, at some point, I do need to go back to Washington, obviously, uh, this week for, for the work that we have uh, there. But uh, as our teams uh, flesh out some of the concepts that are on the table, as necessary, uh, I will return. Uh, I want to be very clear about something that I've, uh, I've said before, but it bears repeating at this juncture. <clears throat> Both Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Abbas have already made important decisions and courageous decisions, uh, difficult decisions. You can see in the press and you see in the public debate uh, that the choices they're making uh, elicit uh, uh, strong responses uh, from uh, their people. And I understand that very, very well. Uh, we're at the table today because of the determination to try to resolve this issue. And both of them have made the tough choices to stay at that table. We are now at a point where the choices narrow down. And the choices uh, are uh, obviously real and difficult. Uh, and so we, the United States, President Obama, uh, myself, will do everything in our power uh, to help the parties be able to see the road ahead in ways that will meet the interests of both of their peoples. The security of Israel is always paramount, in my mind, in our mind. Uh, for 29 years, I had the privilege of serving in the United States Senate, and I'm proud to say I had a 100 percent voting record with respect to those issues of concern to Israel, and I don't intend to change that now. Uh, Israel's security uh, is critical, and the United States relationship is ironclad. But so is our concern for the people of Palestine and for the Palestinians and their future. Uh, and I can guarantee all parties that President Obama and I are committed to putting forward ideas that are fair, that are balanced, <clears throat> and that improve the security of all of the people of this region. Now, obviously, I can't go into the details. I'm not going to start breaking now the uh, agreements that I made uh, with the parties and that I set forth as the rules here. We are not going to negotiate this in public. We are not going to lay out the uh, substance of these core issues. But I can tell everybody all of the core issues are on the table. The difficult issues of security, of territory, <clears throat> borders, <clears throat> excuse me, the future of uh, uh, the <clears throat> um, refugee issue, uh, the status, uh, ultimately, uh, of uh, the city of Jerusalem, uh, and uh, the end of conflict, end of claims, uh, how you arrive at a fair resolution of all of these complicated issues is obviously at the core of what we are talking about. Um, I want to share something that I shared with both of the leaders in my meetings, and that is now is not the time to get trapped in the sort of up and down of the day-to-day -day challenges. Uh, this does not lend itself to a daily tick-tock. Uh, we don't have the luxury of dwelling on the obstacles that we all know <clears throat> could distract us from our goal. 
Uh, what we need to do is lift our sights and look ahead and keep in mind the vision of what can come if we can move forward. Uh, I want to reiterate, we are not working on an interim agreement. We are working on a framework for negotiations that will guide and create the clear, detailed, accepted roadmap for the guidelines for the permanent status negotiations and can help those status negotiations move faster and more effectively. The agreed framework will address all of the core issues that we've been discussing, uh, and uh, I think that's uh, the most that I would like to say about that at this point in time. I do want to be clear. I know there are those out there who, uh, on both sides, question whether or not peace is possible. I know there is a high level of uh, cynicism, reservation about the possibilities. Uh, but it is clear to me that uh, uh, we can work to bridge the remaining gaps that do exist, uh, and we can achieve a final status agreement that results in two states for two peoples if we stay focused and if we keep in mind the benefits of our doing so. Uh, the benefits for both sides are really enormous, and people don't talk about it enough or think about it enough. One of the reasons I'm going to Saudi Arabia is that Saudi Arabia's initiative holds out the prospect that if the parties could arrive at peaceful resolution, you could instantaneously have peace between the 22 Arab nations and 35 Muslim nations, all of whom have said they will recognize Israel if peace is achieved. Imagine how that changes the dynamics of travel, of business, of education, of opportunity in this region, of stability. Imagine what peace could mean for trade and tourism, uh, what it could mean for developing technology and talent, for job opportunities, for a younger generation, for generations in all of these countries. Imagine what peace could mean for an Israel where school children, uh, some of whom I've seen in the course of my many visits here, uh, so that they could actually run around a playground without the threat that a rocket might come from Gaza or from Lebanon uh, and have to seek shelter during the course of a day. Imagine what peace could mean for Palestinian children who could grow up living in the dignity of their own sovereign country with an understanding that they can do what anybody else in the world might be able to aspire to do, free from hatred and free uh, from uh, uh, the fear that accompanies uh, uh, their daily uh, <clears throat> existence and obviously free to embrace all of the opportunities of young people anywhere else in the world. Uh, the ancient and historic city of Jerusalem, where <clears throat> long ago the words were written that have great meaning today. The scripture tells us that the Lord will give strength to his people and the Lord will bless his people with peace. And as men and women of peace, I think in this region, uh, we continue to believe in that possibility. So we stand behind these negotiations that can lead not just to two states for two peoples, but a shared prosperity that benefits the peoples of all of this region. The stakes here are much bigger than just Israel-Palestine. This is a conflict that is felt around the world. It is a conflict that has implications uh, with every leader I have met anywhere in the world, as Secretary of State or Senator. They all ask about the conflict of the Middle East and whether or not it can be resolved. So these are high stakes, high stakes for the leaders and high stakes for everybody else. And uh, President Obama uh, is determined that the United States of America and his administration would do everything in our power to exhaust the possibilities of finding that peace. On that note, I'd be happy to open up to any questions. Who's counting? Who's counting, yes. Um, you know, the negotiations seem to be hung up in some pretty serious roadblocks. I mean, Israel, for example, blocking up 67 lines. That's a pretty big hurdle. Israel's doing what? Blocking up the 67 lines. Oh, you're telling me things that I don't know and that I'm not commenting on, so. Yes, uh, but 
I mean, I don't know where you know. Honestly, I don't know where you know that from. I'm not going to talk about who's balking, not balking, but don't believe what you hear. Okay. What we're doing right now is working through those issues. Okay. I know you don't want to talk about specifics. Can you give the American public, the Israelis, the Palestinians, even one example of something even generally in terms of progress that you've been able to make in, in your uh, 10 trips here? And when the framework is agreed upon, if it's agreed upon, how detailed will it be? Will it include some sort of a deadline, a framework, a uh, frame, time frame for finishing a final trip? Well, let me, let me, let me, let me share with you as best I can sort of how this is working and why I am not going to go into the details. I, I have shared with you that we are talking about all of the core issues, and you know that. You all have traveled out here many times, and you know that the core issues involve territory, and the core issues involve security, and they involve refugees, and they involve uh, the question of recognition for both peoples, uh, and it involves, obviously, ultimately, uh, questions about uh, Jerusalem and how you resolve all claims and, and, and the conflict itself. Now, this is deeply steeped in history. And each side has a narrative about their rights and their journey and, and, and the conflict itself. And in the end, all of these different core issues actually fit together like a mosaic. It's a puzzle. And you can't separate out one piece or another, because what a leader might be willing to do with respect to a compromise on one particular piece is dependent on what the other leader might be willing to do with respect to a different particular piece. And there's always a tension as to when you put your card on the table as to which piece you're willing to do, when and how. So it, it has to move with its particular pace and its particular uh, privacy, frankly. Uh, and that's why it's so important not to be laying out any one particular component of it at any given moment of time, because it actually makes it more difficult for those decisions to be made or for those compromises to be arrived at uh, or for one of the leaders to have the freedom to be able to do what they need to do in order to uh, figure out the, 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 the political path ahead, which is obviously real for both. So the answer is I'm not going to lay out one particular example or another except to say to you that the path is becoming clearer. The puzzle is becoming uh, more defined. And it is becoming much more apparent to everybody what the remaining tough choices are and uh, you know, what the options are with respect to those choices. But it takes time and to work through these things. And I, that's why I have refused to ever set a particular timetable. Uh, and, and, but I feel comfortable that those major choices are now on the table and that the leaders are grappling with these options. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be going to talk to uh, other stakeholders in this process the way I am today. But I cannot tell you when, uh, particularly, the last pieces may decide to fall uh, into place or may fall on the floor uh, and uh, uh, leave the puzzle unfinished. That's exactly what makes this uh, such a challenge and also so interesting at the same time. Not With respect to, I think you had... Uh, what about the, the, how the framework be? <clears throat> I'm not going to go into, again, uh, the, the, <laughs> we'll let the framework speak for itself when and if it is achieved. And, uh, are you seeking some sort of deadline? <clears throat> Otherwise, it does become kind of... Am I thinking of some sort of deadline? Is, sure I am. There's a question about a deadline so that it doesn't just... Get uh, yes. The answer is yes. Okay. I, I, have, uh, I have a deadline in mind. significant number of American um, military personnel died to um, take Fallujah from al-Qaeda in Iraq. And now two years after American forces were withdrawn from Iraq, much of that city has been taken back by an al-Qaeda affiliate. 
the uh, 75 Hellfire missiles that um, the administration is selling to Iraq and the San Diego drones it's planned to deliver by March don't appear to be sufficient to prevent uh, this Al-Qaeda affiliate from controlling uh, much of Anbar and other parts of Iraq. And yesterday, your State Department um, issued a statement saying that American officials have been in touch with Iraqi tribal leaders and that the U.S. was working with the Iraqi government to, quote, support those tribes in every possible way, uh, unquote. My question is, what specific steps is the administration prepared to take to help the Iraqi tribes and the Iraqi government roll back the al-Qaeda advance in western and northern Iraq? Nobody's suggesting U.S. send ground troops, but would the United States be willing to carry out drone strikes from bases outside Iraq? Would you provide arms to the tribes? Uh, the leader of this al-Qaeda affiliate has been designated a global terrorist by the State Department. What specific steps are you prepared to take? Well, Michael, I'm not going to go into uh, all of the specifics. Let me just say in general terms a couple of things. First of all, uh, we are following the events in Ambar province very, very closely, obviously. Uh, we're very, very concerned by the efforts of al-Qaeda and the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, which is affiliated with al-Qaeda, uh, who are trying to assert their authority, not just in Iraq, but in Syria. These are the most dangerous players in that region. Uh, their barbarism against the civilians uh, of Ramadi and Fallujah uh, and against Iraqi security forces is on display for everybody in the world to see. Their brutality is something we have seen before. And we will stand with the government of Iraq and with others who will push back against uh, their efforts to destabilize and to bring back, uh, to wreak havoc uh, on the region and on the democratic process that is taking hold in Iraq. Now, you know, we're going to do everything that is possible to help them. Uh, and I, I will not go into the details except to say that we're in contact with tribal leaders from Ambar province, whom we know who are showing great courage and standing up against this as they reject terrorist groups uh, from their cities. And um, this is a fight that belongs to the Iraqis. That is exactly what the president and the world decided some time ago when we left Iraq. So we are not obviously contemplating returning. We're not contemplating putting boots on the ground. This is their fight. But we're going to help them in their fight. And yes, we have an interest. We have an interest in, in helping the legitimate and elected government uh, be able to push back against uh, uh, the terrorists. This is a fight that is bigger than just Iraq. This is part of the reason why the Geneva Conference is so critical, because the rise of these terrorists in the region, and particularly in Syria and through the fighting in Syria, is part of what is unleashing this instability in the rest of the region. That's why everybody has a stake. All of the Gulf states, all of the regional actors, Russia, the United States, uh, and a lot of players elsewhere in the world have a stake in pushing back against violent extremist terrorists who respect no law, who have no uh, uh, goal other than to take over power and disrupt lives uh, by force. And the United States intends to continue to remain in close contact with all of the Iraq uh, political leaders to see how we can continue to support their efforts in the days ahead. But it is their fight. That is what we determined some time ago, that you know, we can't want peace, and we can't want democracy, and we can't want an orderly government and stability more than the people in a particular area. Uh, in a particular country or a particular region. And so we will help them in their fight, but this fight, uh, in the end, uh, they will have to win, uh, and I'm confident they can.
to all of the principals of Geneva One, isn't it better to have them uh, working alongside you than uh, potentially throwing yeah. you know, <coughs> well, well, Iran could participate very easily if they would simply accept publicly the uh, Geneva One premise on which Geneva Two is based. Uh, we are not going to Geneva to just have a discussion. We are going with the purpose of implementing Geneva One. That was the premise originally that Foreign Minister Lavrov and I announced in Moscow. That has been the premise of organizing this. That will be the premise of the invitation that is sent out by the Secretary General of the United Nations. We are going to implement Geneva One, which calls for a transition government by mutual consent, with full executive authority. And if Iran doesn't support that, it's very difficult to see how they're going to be, quote, a a ministerial partner in the process. Now, could they contribute from the sidelines? Are there ways for them, conceivably, to weigh in? Uh, can their mission that is already in Geneva, uh, you know, be there in order to uh, help the process? It may be that there are ways that that could happen. But that has to be determined by the Secretary General. It has to be determined by Iranian intentions themselves. Uh, but in terms of a formal invitation or participation, that is for those who support the Geneva One implementation. And that's the purpose of the Geneva Conference. Would you like to see Foreign Minister Zarif attend uh, on the sidelines then, at, at the invitation of the well, Secretary General? I, I think I just spoke to it. I think that we're, we're happy to have Iran be helpful. Everybody is happy to have Iran be helpful. Uh, but we have a huge piece of business on the table with Iran right now to complete the task of the implementation language and get uh, moving with respect to the negotiations on their own nuclear program and the challenge of uh, 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 that particular relationship. So Iran knows exactly what it has to do with respect to uh, the nuclear program as well as with respect to Geneva II. And uh, it, it's, it's very simple. Uh, come join the community of nations uh, and do what all of us are committed to doing, which is try to bring about a peaceful resolution in Syria uh, by virtue of the implementation of Geneva One. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Appreciate it.